So Rahul has uh, co-founded several companies uh, in this uh, biometric space. And today he's representing International Biometrics uh, Indonesia, which is uh, responsible for uh, for managing the system backends uh, of the program, the, the, the back end of the program. So he believes in um, uh, inclusive systems and uh, he is a keen supporter of uh, development of infrastructure for uh, public good. Without further ado, I will um, let um, Rahul share the stage. Thank you. Thank Hi, you, Rahul. Zubair. Hello. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you for the kind words. Uh, I would like to start with thanking API Days Jakarta to invite me to present something that I'm passionate about and keeping the time uh, you know, you know, uh, in mind, I would go directly to the presentation. So as I said, and what you actually introduced me is like, um, I've been a pro playing a key role in many national ID programs. Some of them have been of significant size. Today, I'm going to touch upon a very interesting topic uh, that how does a national ID program accelerate digital economy, especially in this age of uh, digital transformation and the COVID-19 uh, pandemic scenarios. So my opening statement to this topic would be is that you know trust is the keystone of commerce or trade and trust, trusted identity is established that trust. So anyone who wants to interact with a person who they does not know or is not in front of him, trust is the first thing you need uh, in order to transact. So before we get to the uh, actual crux of the presentation, what I'd like to do is talk about a little bit uh, of my experiences. Uh, as you mentioned, I have been the, the key architect uh, for the biometric service providers role in the India National ID, which is Aadhaar. Uh, as you know, it's 1.3 billion plus people enrolled with trimodal biometrics. And I think everybody knows it's a, it has a very significant impact on how it has driven the digital economy and digital technologies. Uh, the second largest program that I would proudly mention is also where I was the architect for the end-to-end -end system is the Indonesia National ID called the KTPL or Electronic KTP. It right now has 196 million plus people enrolled with trimodal biometrics. And when I say trimodal, it's face, finger, and iris uh, biometrics. I'm also the uh, architect for the biometric service provider for Turkey National ID, which is targeted to you know, achieve 70 million plus enrollments. Uh, currently, it's 35 million plus, and it's ongoing. Today, I'm representing um, the International Biometrics Indonesia, uh, which is responsible for managing the Indonesia National ID. I'm also a co-founder for TechFi SA, which is a technology provider company uh, which provides the biometric algorithms based out of Geneva, Switzerland. In the past, I've been work working with companies like Identix, L1 Identity, and Idemia. So let's start with uh, the fundamental. Yeah, uh, what is identity? Identity is something that defines us. Is the fact of being, you know, who or what a person is. It basically describes the set of unique characteristics or attributes uh, that distinguish one individual from another. They are typically derived from uh, attributes like name, date of birth, physical traits like how do you look, how do you, what are your fingerprints, your iris, and, and so on, and a variety of other social uh, factors, including your home address, occupation, and so on. Um, as you know, or may be familiar with, in uh, many countries, uh, citizens are issued with an identity number as part of a birth registration program. And that happens to stick with you all your life as that becomes the basis from which you, uh, as you grow on, uh, you start to build your other uh, credentials. Why is identity important? Um, identity plays the most you know, important role in facilitating you know, interaction uh, between individuals. You know, and individuals with uh, the government, individuals with other individuals, and individuals with private institution uh, to operate in a structured society. It is, uh, I think, the most important pillar uh, for, for a lot of reasons, uh, because we as, as uh, humans cannot operate without a society. And you can imagine uh, that without a robust means of providing, you know, proving one's identity, exercising, you know, one's basic rights, claiming entitlements, accessing a range of government services, conducting basic uh, daily activities, 
and participating in growth could be hampered. So without identity, uh, you know, participating in a society is almost impossible. The identities or the identity systems that manage the identities uh, can be categorized into three major categories. One is the foundational identity, which is basically is created using um, some form of a, a national registry where you know your fundamental uh, documents like birth certificates or marriage certificates or certain sort of documents are examined in order to issue that identity. It is called foundational for a reason because it forms the basics uh, uh, you know for the for the for the ID. A functional identity is one that is created for specific needs. Uh, as you can imagine, um, uh, you know the, you have needs like medical or driver's license IDs, and then the foundational ID can be then taken to derive these other functional ID identities. Then there is uh, the ongoing you know, new concept of trans transactional identities, which are basically meant for that particular transaction. Uh, when you have to do, uh, you know, perform transactions either face to face or, or across the internet, this could be temporary. Uh, excuse me, Rahul. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, are you going to present your uh, slides, or at this? Uh, could oh, you could uh, you share a presentation, please? That is interesting. Yeah, yeah. And that, that's, that's a button is? down there. There's a button down there which 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 shows an icon next to the, the third button from the left. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Apologies for that. Uh, you know, we <laughs> So yeah, I'm just going to continue. Um, so the the foundational ID, national ID, uh, national ID is a foundational ID as it is generally issued to all the citizens of a country. Yeah? And sometimes it includes uh, the permanent and temporary residents. It becomes the basis for the other functional IDs. Many countries have some form of national ID. They are increasingly now becoming electronic or digital, uh, you know, digital IDs. Digital ID is the buzzword these days. In this day, uh, you know, age of digital transformation, the national ID is the most effective in its digital or electronic form. So you may have seen, uh, you know, national ID cards uh, or, you know, passports in sometimes, but when it becomes digital, it, it has proven to be the most effective. What are the guiding principles of a national ID? First of all, the institution that is implementing has to define its mission. What are the goals it's, you know, it is aiming to uh, achieve and pursue? And then a nice mission uh, or a mission that is details on how, you, how they're going to reach those goals. The second principle I would say is, you know, social inclu in inclusiveness. Uh, this is the most important factor uh, because uh, in order for the nation or the or the country to grow, uh, you need to have inclusion uh, as, as the key principle. Uh, everybody in the society, irrespective of their caste, creed, and layers, need to be able to participate in, in the growth of the community. The third, I would say, is trust, privacy, and security. The, the program should ensure ad adequate safeguards for privacy of users and to guarantee an appropriate level of information security. This is important uh, as because, you know, by ensuring the security and privacy, you build the trust that is required for people to transact, not only transact in you know, commerce, but also trust your own government and participate in the government programs. Uniqueness of the ID, uh, of course, is the most important uh, aspect uh, because you know, the trust comes from the fact that you believe in the program that nobody is able to get a duplicate ID. The, uh, the other important uh, principles are sustainability and cost optimization. This is important because most of the national ID programs tend to use the sovereign budgets to implement such programs, but then it has a short time, uh, you know, and in order to sustain uh, the growth of the program and keep serving the, the citizens, uh, there has to be a sustainability uh, consideration where somehow the program should generate revenues to keep itself you know, uh, progressing. Interoperability should be considered definitely because uh, one central authority having all the control is not preferred in any democratic, uh, let's say, country or a nation. 
So you would definitely want to have a system that is interoperable and other systems can interact and exchange information. Economic and social prosperity, again, uh, boils down to inclusion. Uh, how do you maximize the uh, inclusion uh, by you know, creating these uh, digital environments? Um, identity as a platform. Uh, just creating a ID system and ID number is not something that uh, helps the growth of a nation. It also needs to be state of the art, future proof, and somehow uh, expose um, the platform for usage by uh, public and private sectors. I'll be talking about it more as we go down the slides. And last but not least is, you know, how do you maximize the adoption and uh, the reach? So you need to create an e ecosystem that, you know, encourages the citizens. So making mandatory is not the solution. It is somehow uh, driven by the government's will to encourage people to participate. And this is all again achieved by how do you build the trust? How do you make the services convenient, frictionless, uh, and uh, you know, somehow bring the, the notion of uh, uh, adoption? As I said, you know, the success of a national ID program starts with how, you know, establishing uniqueness of the citizens. Yeah. And when I say establishing uniqueness means to ensure that nobody can get a duplicate ID and biometrics, uh, as you may have heard already, are the most popular, uh, I would say attributes that are used to uh, ensure that. And especially when there is a lack of any fundamental birth registration or similar system. So biometrics, um, as you can imagine, are the physical traits that are used uh, when you are onboarding the people. And the, the biometrics that are most commonly used are face image, which is the picture of your face, fingerprints, fingerprint scans, and iris scans. And why do we um, recommend all three, or at least two, is because one single modality will not be able to cover the, uh, you know, the entire population. And especially in the developing countries where people you know work in farms and uh, you know there is a large variation in age and, and their occupations so big programs like india indonesia and you know some other countries are using trimodal biometrics because the numbers are huge uh, but some countries with significant population also you know opt to go at least two modalities now Establishing an ID by onboarding people is one thing. Then the second uh, phase when it comes to is the actual use of the ID. That's where the verification of the identity comes in place. Again, uh, verification of identities can be achieved in, you know, in many, many forms. Uh, but the, the most convenient uh, that has been used in, again, developing countries is the biometric based verification. Uh, in this, again, I would quickly highlight that, you know, face, as you can imagine, is the most convenient and cost effective way of verification, but it does have some privacy concerns. Fingerprint technology is gaining traction because in the past you would use fingerprint scanners, but now uh, you can use, uh, you know, mobile phones. There are cameras to capture fingerprints with touchless technologies. So you don't have to buy a scanner anymore. And the last one is the iris, which is the most private and accurate modality, but it depends on a scanner, specific scanner, and which uh, kind of limits is um, adoption in wide scale deployments. Now let's talk about digital identity. So far what we talked, you know, spoke about was a national ID, uh, you know, creating a unique identity for a person in some form, of, you know, that can be then used to verify the, the identity. Digital identity, what it does is that it allows you know, to take your national ID and then be verified digitally anywhere, anytime. And uh, again, digital identity itself is a very big uh, field, uh, or you say you know, it, it can be defined from username, password, all the way to a sophisticated biometric based ID. So in the context of today's topic, I'm gonna, when I refer to digital identity, I'm going to talk about electronic national ID systems, which are Again, based on biometrics. So government and commercial organizations, they all value trust, you know, and the trusted digital identity because without it, the digital economy cannot function effectively. The most effective digital IDs are derived from national ID systems with combination of some or the other uh, attributes from other functional um, identities. With the EN, you know, electronic national ID in place, governments can take the lead in promoting high value trust-based digital economic and social interactions. 
It also helps public and private sector in ex extending e-commerce and creating an entirely new peer-to-peer -peer interaction and economy with appropriate regulations in place. Um, so, you know, there, there is a, um, a you know, number in the report that says the online economy is now worth a trillion dollars uh, with, you know, in a B2C sector. And most of the transactions are now performed where neither of the parties are physically present. I think we are all experiencing that. Uh, so it's nothing new that we find out. So what are the benefits to the user of the electronic national IDs? Yeah? Uh, and again, these are some key, key benefits. Not, you know, there are many more. So what does it do? It improves the you know, uh, convenience and user experience by removing some of the barriers that people usually face uh, when they are trying to get access to their services. It also reduces the cost of access uh, to the services that are either offered by the government or by the private sector. It reduces uh, you know, the loss of uh, in income by not having to go to offices and get documentation and prove your identity, uh, especially the people in the lower income tier. And then it does improve the citizens' inclusive uh, inclusion, which basically means that everybody in the you know, economy or in the community is able to participate uh, irrespective of where they belong into the, uh, in, the, in the layers of the community. The benefits that it provides to the public sector is uh, you know, it improves, improves the service delivery by enabling the governments to deliver to their citizens more efficiently. There is a more targeted uh, approach that the government state can take in welfare and social programs. Uh, we have seen a lot of these come into play, especially in the recent COVID scenarios where governments were very effectively able to deliver um, you, you know, the, 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 the funds and the monies that were allocated to helping people with, because of the, the whole pandemic. Yeah? In fact, some of the um, Asian countries were doing faring far better than the Western countries, which lack such uh, infrastructure. Reducing the cost of delivery, again, um, by cutting the middle layer, uh, sorry, by cutting the cost uh, of, you know, delivery by re removing personnel and um, middle layers, it helps the, uh, benefits the ultimate um, beneficiaries. Plus, you know, then reducing leakages and losses, you know, losses by implementing direct channels. Uh, you remove middle layers, you eradicate the ghost identities. And by, by having this, uh, which again, when you reduce the losses, that money or funds can be utilized better in helping the, the right uh, you know, people. It also helps in improving security. This is more towards the policing and crime prosecution, um, not really directly relevant to, uh, to the uh, you know, digital economy, but it is important because it helps in combating certain crimes such as identity fraud and, and, and tax fraud, uh, which again, ultimately helps in boosting the economy. Um, and then the, the last, uh, I would say, is in, in the benefits is going to be for the private sector. Uh, it opens up a lot of uh, revenue opportunities. Uh, you know, it, you know it, it creates this ecosystem where people come up with uh, ideas that nobody had even thought of. It's just because there is a way now to quickly onboard people, trust them, and start delivering products and services um, that, that nobody had ever thought of. Again, for the private sector, also it impacts by reducing the, the cost of service delivery. Uh, again, by reducing personnel, reducing you know, the paperwork, and the time needed to complete each transaction. Ultimately, this increases the customer base by making it convenient um, and also helping to quickly onboard people uh, at the same time, expand the geographical reach. The key role of uh, identity verification, again, as I said, it helps in trust, uh, establishing the trust. The ways the, these are exposed to public and private sector is by exposing free or paid APIs for identity verification by some central authority. Uh, paid or for-profit approach allows the institution to sustain. Uh, we have seen some free approaches that have not sustained, and that's why I had to highlight this point. For countries with weak infrastructure, um, where you know where, where the internet is not everywhere, the technologies that offer fully offline verifications are a must. Um, again, this approach does not have to be a smart card based approach. I have a slide talking about it. 
uh, how, where it, you know, how it helps. And then finally, there are approaches where identity exchanges are coming in place, especially where countries do not have a central authority. And then multiple digital identity sources feed into these exchanges, uh, which then help the uh, users to leverage the identity framework. Um, as I said, you know, digital identity requires digital um, connections, infrastructure, internet. So there is a wide um, acceptance and attraction to mobile IDs these days because of the high penetration rate uh, of the mobile phones. Uh, you know, we know that at least one of the parties transacting has a mobile phone. So even if it's a person trying to get his uh, food subsidy in the middle of the jungle, the person who goes there to deliver that has a mobile phone or can be given a mobile phone. So with a mix of online APIs uh, plus some mobile ID, uh, maximum population can be reached. Uh, national ID in the mobile ID form can blur the lines between a physical ID and a, a physical credential and then the and a digital ID effective in increasing the reach, uh, which we you know uh, always call as solving the last mile problem. The direct impact on digital economy again, um, an ID plays a key role due to the fact that it provides the frame, framework for ensuring trust um, by enforcing security and privacy, at the same time reducing the friction and maximizes the reach and coverage at the same time. Uh, reports uh, say that extending coverage of ENID could actually unlock 3 to 13% of uh, GDP of uh, developing countries. Frameworks uh, that reduce the dependence and infrastructure status of the country further accelerate the growth. Uh, again, these have to be using innovative ideas like mobile IDs and, and you know, digital IDs that can be present physically. ANID encourages digital business models and thus enabling leveraging the economies of scale. The more people participate, the, the, the more uh, transactions, the more money flows around. And most important, in the current COVID situation or in the post-pandemic scenarios also, it's going to help to people to transact safely, uh, which is helping economies survive. Yeah, So you don't have to go anywhere. You can sit at home, leverage the digital economies, transact. Uh, if it, this was not around, if we did not have the digital, uh, uh, let's say, models, uh, many countries would have collapsed by now. What are the steps taken to accelerate the adoption of uh, digital IDs and you know, to boost the digital economies? First of all is investment in the, in the prerequisites of developing the digital economy, such as uh, mobile broadband infrastructure, um, investment you know, into effective payment systems like India did, the UPI, then fint uh, fintech friendly ecosystems and electronic signatures. So as, as soon as you remove the interactions and need for any physical interaction, um, it helps automatically helps to uh, grow the economy. Then there is promoting the digital verifications. Again, including biometric systems has been a key role uh, because it, is, it offers the security. And uh, with the latest biometric technologies that are touchless, uh, that reduces the risk of uh, contact and need to be in physical presence. Uh, expansion of open APIs. Again, you know, the more uh, the governments or the institutions open up the access to the APIs, uh, people become creative and new applications uh, you know, are developed and business models are built. The countries also need to aggressively adapt uh, their legal and regulatory frameworks to make the ecosystem conducive yeah? and to ensure competitiveness um, so you can, it can thrive. Uh, last but not least, incentivizing the usage of digital identities. Uh, and some countries are doing this by subsidizing the transaction cost or providing tax breaks and whatever it takes uh, to you know, get more people on, on the platforms. The digital ID accelerates the digital economy yeah, by, by offering the following benefits to any institution that is using FinTech. Um, and again, you know, this also applies to digital banking, but let's keep the digital fin FinTech as the focus. Uh, again, I'm just going to quickly read through these uh, in the interest of time. It reduces the risk of fraud uh, because of trust, ease of compliance, um, you know, you know uh, companies can uh, comply with the regulatory requirements by doing biometric uh, based onboarding and EKYCs. Faster growth, again, because of EKYCs, you can reach more cust bigger customer base, reduces operational cost, uh, drives you know, cashless economies, increases revenue uh, because your bottom line, is going down, bottom line goes down, uh, promotes competitiveness because you have more people uh, with open APIs and building interesting 
uh, use cases and business scenarios, like sharing economies, uh, for example. You can fine tune the offerings. Um, cross border transactions are possible. No more, uh, you have to be in one country to transact. You could be anywhere in the world and still trust by using some trusted identity frameworks. Um, audit traces and analytics, uh, again, two different things, but does help to improve the customer experience on offering. Speed of transactions goes up. Um, again, due to the fact you can verify quickly. Security is improved, customer experience. Yeah, uh, sorry, Rahul, uh, we are running short of time. Uh, I would uh, have your closing comments, please. Sure, I think the, the this was the last slide. Um, yes, thank you. thank you so much. Yeah, so I think the effective, you know, an effectively implemented national ID program becomes the basis for a good digital or mobile ID. The benefits offered by digital and mobile ID not only promote inclusive growth, but also increase the convenience, allowing large percentage of the population to transact. And beyond coverage, it further enhances the framework to offer a large variety of products and services to the existing population base. So you don't have to increase people, you just add more products to your uh, economy. And all these results in you know, accelerating the digital economy and sustaining growth. So these are some of the references that I would mention that I've referred to. And with that, I will conclude my uh, presentation and uh, open up for Q&A. Yeah, uh, thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, unfortunately, we have uh, no time for the Q&A and uh, probably uh, we will uh, get in touch with you uh, for uh, any further questions from the, from the, from the audience. Thank you, Zubair. Thanks for the uh, invite and have a good day. Yeah, really Thank now. you so much. Have a great day, Rahul. Thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye.